Tyson, thanks for coming. Today's presenter is Neil Thielander. Neil is, um, uh, he runs his own consulting business, Cloud Juice IT Consulting. Been in the IT industry 28 years? I was uh, the IT director at uh, QUT, so I did lecture occasionally, but uh, I had about 200 staff and uh, running quite a big uh, IT operation, about a million hours a week of computing activity. Right. Because of all the students. Yeah. Mainly. What is cloud computing? Uh, cloud uh, is an extension of uh, the internet technology that's been around for some time and what it basically does is uses the internet as a means of getting to computing capabilities, to data storage or to uh, computational capabilities. So rather than having those things uh, in a computer on your desk or in a room nearby, uh, you have them somewhere else and you get to them uh, via the internet. Just take us. Uh, what uh, cloud providers do uh, because of the internet, what they can do uh, because of the internet, is uh, introduce what, uh, there's a technical term, what's called redundancy. People are familiar with this notion of redundancy. So this is the idea that instead of having one copy of your data, there'll be multiple copies of your data uh, located in multiple places, and the coordination of the updating of those multiple copies is handled by uh, more sophisticated file systems that have been uh, developed over the last few years. Uh, one of those, for example, IBM developed uh, and it's made available to the rest of the world. It's called GPFS, it stands for General Purpose File System. There's half a dozen different variations on this same idea, but what these systems do basically is manage multiple copies of the same data so that if one of those copies, one of the computers on which one of those copies uh, gets blown up or for some reason vanishes, you've still got copies of your data out there. So it changes the reliability of your data quite dramatically. Uh, takes it pretty close to the point of the data never not being available. Okay. Depends on how many copies. Uh, I, I do some work for a client uh, in genomics research and they keep three copies of their data. Uh, they have to keep it on disk because there's so much data and they don't have the time to get it back from tape if they do need to use it. The tape is just too slow. We're talking about uh, petabytes of data, thousands of terabytes of data. Uh, one human genome for cancer research purposes is about one terabyte. So if you want to pattern match 500 uh, you know, genomes in order to do your research, you can't get that back off tape. So anyway, that's the model genomics use. They have three disk copies. Uh, they usually have two of them locally and one of them remote. Most high-end applications of, of, of the cloud have taken those sorts of decisions about what suits their particular needs. Anyway, that's the basics. That's the basics of, uh, of uh, the cloud. It, it takes what would have been nearby as a, a source of computing power and puts it out there in the internet and adds this extra dimension of redundancy, hence reliability to your data storage and, and, and computation, uh, computational capacity. So uh, why has this happened over the last five or 10 years? Uh, because uh, companies like Google in particular have changed the performance of the internet. The internet used to be too slow. Those of you who have been around for a while probably remembers when WWW used to stand for World Wide Wait. Was so <laughs> uh, Google uh, worked on this very hard for five to ten years uh, to accelerate their search engine. So that the response to that search engine, when you do a Google search now, it's you know half a second, one and a half seconds. It's, a, it's amazingly fast, given what it has to do, the information that it serves back to you. Well, they pioneered a whole lot of techniques to make that happen. Technical jargon. There's this. But anyway, they made those things open, and those things are now widely used in the internet. The consequence is that the response time of the internet uh, has reduced dramatically, down to around global response times between 5 and 15 seconds. So you can access things across the internet in that sort of time range. So that makes it doable to have computer systems effectively distributed across the internet globally. Can I answer that sort of question? Indeed. Neil, with um, emails, for example, uh, they reside on your server in your office. Where does your information reside when you're working through the cards? Uh, Google has uh, a number of massive data centres. Uh, so there's around a physical the presence somewhere with great there big are, machines. There are physical data centres that uh, they build and own and run, 
and pump huge amounts of electricity into to keep them up and running. Uh, Google have a very highly tuned act with their data centers. They uh, believe in this redundancy, reliability stuff, so they actually put into their data centers very cheap equipment. Uh, they put their computers on cardboard rather than on uh, uh, solid backed uh, this is the kind of uh, uh, things that you see inside your computer. They, they, they have a very cheap computing model. That's why they're able to offer uh, data, uh, email services and those sorts of things with very high free components uh, to get you involved. Uh, these, uh, Google, Microsoft, uh, and a couple of others next year will, uh, will spend in 2012 about $1 billion each uh, on their data centers. Uh, Apple has just finished a data center to support iCloud. Mm -hmm. Probably seen the announcement of iCloud. Uh, that the data center that they built for iCloud is five times bigger than their previous data center in California. Uh, it's in North Carolina. It cost them about one billion dollars to build one data center. Uh, Microsoft is building data centers uh, at quite a rapid rate through 2012 as well. They don't usually build them in one big one. They usually build uh, several of them. But they're still quite large, you know, they'd be about a third or a quarter the size of that sort of thing. These are massive endeavours. Uh, this is the economy of scale that comes from being able to put stuff out there in the cloud. So they're, they're generating effectively a global scale economy because everyone can use Gmail and you don't care where Gmail sits. But uh, uh, when I use Gmail, when people send me email, all of my data in, in, uh, in Gmail, my, my Google data, is sitting across multiple data centers. So it's not just sitting in one, it's sitting in multiple. They, they, they back up their data across uh, multiple storage devices, across multiple, uh, multiple sites. I mentioned uh, IBM's general purpose file system. Uh, these, uh, these file management systems, these distributed file management systems, use quite sophisticated techniques for distributing the data so that you're keeping effectively full copies at those multiple locations. So you don't know where it is. Uh, you, you, you can never know. Yeah. And uh, they wouldn't be able to find out either. They wouldn't know. They would just know that the data is being distributed in certain volumes. It's a bit, it would be a bit like asking uh, the electricity company where my electricity came from. They wouldn't have a clue. Right? It just came to me through a reticulation system. Uh, this uh, emergence over the last five to 10 years, certainly the last five years, of cloud is, is kind of the computing equivalent of AC current. Now you can get your computing basically from anywhere in the world, right? the economies of scale go through the roof. I think the, the, the core of it uh, for folk who want to uh, manage an orderly transition into the cloud uh, is risk management. And we can talk a little bit about that. I, I had quite a bit of experience with that at the university when we uh, rolled out. We moved all of our students across to Gmail and uh, so I can tell a bit of a story about how that happened and how we did it. Uh, most of the universities in Australia and many of the universities uh, around the world have shifted their students across to email, which is provided by the cloud, either from uh, Google through Gmail or Microsoft through Windows Live. Uh, when we did this at QUT, uh, we weren't the first, we were about the fifth university in Australia to do it. Uh, we adopted uh, the Australian Standard for Risk Management as a way of doing this. Uh, we involved a number of the senior executives in evaluating what their risk concerns were and we went through quite a well documented uh, process of risk treatment in order to satisfy everyone, top down, auditors, that uh, this was a sensible done way. And uh, I recommend that model. Uh, it's, it's quite a professional way to go about it. You keep a good record of your recognition of the key risks and also are able to write up uh, whether you've accepted the risk or the extent to which you've uh, mitigated the risk by various means. And there are uh, with uh, cloud migration, a fairly standard set of risks, most of which you've asked questions about. You know, how do we ensure data security? Uh, how do we deal with uh, cross-border issues? Is a bit of a sleeper. That, you know, and I, think I sent you a document I think on cross-border issues that Macquarie Telecom has produced. And you've done some of this, you're not as aware of it. There are real issues with where your data might reside. If you know your data resides in California and are basing your business on the fact that your data is being operated out of California, then you can make yourself subject to the taxation system of California. But there's actually quite a bit of uh, danger about knowing where your data is. Well, you're better off not knowing because then you've had no part in situating yourself to achieve certain things. 
So there's, there's quite a lot of complexity behind that issue, the cross-border issue. Yeah, so uh, there's an Australian standard for risk management. I think the number is uh, 4,400. Anyway, I recommend you use that. Uh, for any of you who have done uh, corporate risk management work or risk management work with projects, there's fairly standard templates that you can use. It's a, it's a, it's a nice thorough process. And uh, I have got actually a, a, a template that I'd be happy to share. It, it, it provides for six or eight of the fairly standard risk factors that people usually focus on when they keep thinking about climate migration or should focus on and some of the treatments that can be adopted or risks that can be accepted. Someone said to me, someone who, who works in the space as well, an IT person said, um, when, when I said, is this what I have to do, is this where we have to go, his comment was, you would not put your uh, business critical applications in the cloud. Do you agree with that? <laughs> well, I'm afraid the answer is it depends. Uh, that, that's very much like a, an accountant's response or a tax agent's <laughs> yeah. response. It, it depends on so many different things, yeah. Well, what if uh, your competitors had moved their stuff to the cloud and were eating you alive in the marketplace because they were able to do their, provide their service so much more cheaply because they were doing it in the cloud? Then you probably would see it as business critical to put your stuff into the cloud. So I mean, that's a bit like what happened to universities and student email. Because the annual provision of a student email service, right, is a, it's a big deal in terms of the experience of the students. Well, we ran uh, two pilots. We couldn't decide you know, uh, whether to use Google or to use Microsoft. So in two separate faculties, we ran two trials of 50 students each. We set them up with uh, the Gmail system and the Windows Live system. And we ran this pilot bless our little hearts, for about six months. How cautious are we, right? And at the end of the six months, the students came back to us, 99% came back to us and said, we don't care, just hurry up and do it. <laughs> because they're both so much better than the email system you currently provide. The, the email system we were affording for about half a million dollars a year for our students was giving them 200 megabytes of storage, right? And had all of these functional limitations, right? It was an expensive email system, but we had to buy it and maintain it, upgrade the software. So I'm, sp I'm spending a fortune maintaining this email system compared to Gmail and Microsoft, who are both offering <laughs> 15 or 25 gigs of free storage, right? Access to all of these new features, access to a continuing source of innovation, right? They're making improvements to these packages and everything that goes with them all the time, and I don't have to do any of this, right? So, uh, Macquarie University was the first to go across. So all the other universities start looking at Macquarie University and looking at the positive experience their students are having. There's no way. I mean, if we, we could not afford to mimic the service that they were getting from Google or Windows Live. So the universities uh, in Australia have pretty much gone across. All the major ones have anyway. And they're pretty much split 50-50 too, I've got to say, between uh, Google and Microsoft. You know, the decision in the end kind of came down to whether uh, they had a lot of Microsoft stuff already, which was going to be better integrated if they went the Microsoft way. To answer your question, I, I think you will put business critical stuff in the cloud, but you have to do it extremely carefully. I described the risk management process that we went through. We didn't go, we went into it very much with our eyes open. Uh, I wouldn't rush in, but you know, the more business critical something is, the more you're going to be careful about it, right? You're going to think about every one of these risks. What's the upside? What's the downside? How do I protect myself and my clients? We looked at um, using cloud, but hosting our software on a, yep. on a colo in town yep. about uh, 18 months ago, right. rather than hosting it out in Rock Lee. Mm. In the end, we went and hosted it in, uh, in the valley. Mm. Come January, our building was three metres underwater. We were able to get onto a 3G card right. and operate over Citrix. It's not the same as cloud, but mm. a similar, so that did save us. Mm. You know, we would have been completely bugged without that. So uh, I think that's the experience of one of our clients as well. We were, they were flooded and uh, were kept out of the office mm. one point, and they are in the clouds. So they said it was situation normal. Mm. But they do comment that it's slower uh, than, than it would be otherwise. Uh, what, what's your experience with speed? Well, I describe all the work that Google have done 
over the last few years to uh, to accelerate response time, but it's still down in that five to fifteen second range. Uh, one of the resources that's in this document, which I'm happy for you to distribute, is uh, a crowd called uh, Cloud Sleuth. Uh, they're, they're kind of a, a cloud middleman service, if you like, and what they do is they monitor the performance of cloud services. So at any given time, you can see what the current response rate is of a whole lot of different cloud providers. Uh, it depends uh, where they've situated the main data center that you're accessing. So if you're using Amazon, for example, you'll get a faster response time out of the Singapore uh, data center that supports their services. Uh, anyway, it's that sort of thing. But it is in the range 5 to 15 seconds. It depends where you are or how close you are to the main internet backbone. The global backbone to the internet, which is high speed, you know, the further away from that you are, then, uh, then the slower you'll be. Yeah, it, it will always be slower. That's the advantage of this sort of solution. You can highly tune it. I mean, if you wanted uh, one second response times, right, then you wouldn't use it. But there's a kind of emerging community standard here. And I think, you know, I spoke about risk management. I also have a bit of a view that there's a community standard around a whole lot of this stuff. You know, certainly emerging with the digital natives, you know, the next generation, they have a certain level of expectation and a certain flexibility around all of this stuff. If one of their services, like Facebook, for example, doesn't work, it's not working at the moment, they don't care. They just go and do something else and come back later. Right? And it'll be back later when they come back. So they have a different sort of attitude to the availability of these services. Yeah. I would have thought it was the reverse, in fact. That's quite interesting. You ask them, what happens when Facebook goes away? They just do something else. Or they depend upon it, and if they expect it to be there, if it's not there, no, they'll do something else. I mean, I, I can tell, I tell you a little bit about uh, <coughs> uptime with data centers. Uh, it's actually an incredibly uh, well-organized discipline, if you like, in its own sense. I'm talking about data centers now and how reliable they are. Uh, there's a, a crowd called the Uptime Institute, which tracks stats on a whole on literally hundreds, probably thousands by now, of registered data centres globally. So this is all the main data centres we were talking about. Uh, they have a tiering system. So there's tiers one, two, three, and four. Tier one and two are quite similar. Tiers three and four are effectively fully redundant data centres. So the data centres have complete duplication of all electrical, air conditioning, power, distribution, all facilities. They literally cost twice as much to build. Uh, tier 3 and Tier 4 data centres. But the difference in uptime uh, equates to a few percentage points. A Tier 1 data centre typically has about 95% uptime. In other words, it's not working for about 5% of the year. Whereas a Tier 3 or Tier 4 data centre is 99 plus percent. Tier 4 gets up to 99.75. So what you're talking about, we spoke about outages. You know, what sort of outages should you expect? <coughs> One of the uh, the internet links that I included in my response to Anthony's questions was to point to the top 10 outages of cloud services uh, over the last year. And most of the big service providers have had one major outage over the last year. That is consistent with tier four data centers. A tier four data center will typically have one big outage every year, usually in the six to 12 hour range. So you should expect that. This is risk management. Yeah. And uh, that's based on stats. By the way, these numbers, these 99.75% and so on, they're not uh, estimates. They're the average of what actually happens to the data centres that are rated at these different tier levels. The tier definitions are specified in terms of the way they are designed and run in terms of <coughs> duplication of key facilities and so uh, on. This is not the same as your data centres, I've got to say. Your data centres typically will be down around somewhere between tier one and tier two. It's very expensive to build a tier four data centre. Uh, uh, University data centres, for example, are mostly tier two, and uh, they achieve redundancy by having multiple data centres. So at QUT, for example, there's a data centre at Gardens Point and one at Kelvin Grove. And so key services are duplicated across those two data centres. So rather than have a, a tier four data centre in one place, right, we, we more cheaply build two separate data centres and then we can run different things out of them. That's what, that's what most businesses and most universities do. The banks go a bit further. Cloud service providers typically go to tier four because they can afford to. Once you get up to this massive scale, again, the economies of scale kick in to the duplication of these facilities. So you get things with cloud services that you know a lot of us don't even know we need. Okay, You will get outage, but you should expect 
that low level crowd. How, how many service providers are there? Uh, Tens, items, hundreds, thousands? Uh, thousands. There's, right. a, there's, a, there's a, a real ecosystem of them. Uh, there's a top ten list that I included in here. This list that uh, Neil is referring to, it's, it's a whole lot of questions that I put to Neil and Neil's come back with a whole lot of responses. Mm. So if you would like a copy, just let me know at the end of it and we'll email it to you, assuming we've got your email address. The, uh, uh, the top ten list, uh, as it currently is, is headed by Amazon. You would have heard of Amazon. Uh, it's, uh, they, they make the list based on how much revenue they make out of the cloud. So Amazon's up there. Uh, Verizon, you know, big telco in the US is number two, uh, number two with a bullet. They actually bought a large cloud provider, uh, well, a smaller but still large cloud provider called Terramark, who owned a lot of data centres. So they sort of jumped into the cloud business as an adjunct to their telecommunications business. Uh, Google, obviously, Microsoft, they're all in the top ten, usually jostling around three, four or five, that sort of thing. Uh, IBM has made a real business out of the cloud, very successful. I visited uh, their cloud centre in uh, Beijing and uh, uh, they very cleverly got in quite early with the Chinese and have been for years now uh, showing the Chinese authorities and Chinese businesses how to stick their stuff into the cloud. So they've got this massive cloud centre in, uh, in Beijing, as I said, but it's not so much about the infrastructure, it's about educating people in how to use the cloud. It's quite an interesting thing. They come in, uh, they spend a day there uh, uh, describing their needs, and the IBM people uh, effectively build them a, cloud, a version, a kind of a demonstration version of their systems in the cloud to, to show them how it would work. It's that sort of demo model again. Uh, anyway, they're the top 10. Uh, these top 10 are typically spending a billion dollars a year on data centres, uh, making uh, tens or hundreds of millions in revenue from cloud services at that sort of scale. But then after that, there's all sorts of people that are sitting on top of, uh, some of them actually use those major cloud service providers as the platform that they then offer their services on top. Facebook has their own data centres that they run Facebook on, but not all uh, of the major uh, software as a service providers do. I think salesforce.com is a big uh, CRM uh, service provider, I think they piggyback others. A lot of people use Amazon, that's why Amazon is so big, it's become kind of like the gold standard for compute and data services in, in the cloud. And they are also the most expensive, okay, so it's, there used to be a saying back in the 70s and 80s, uh, you never get fired for buying IBM. Amazon's the same sort of thing in the cloud, you know, you kind of won't get fired for using Amazon as a cloud service provider. They are the most expensive, but they're probably the best. So, so if we choose one of those, mm. how, do, how do we get charged? What, what's the basis of um, paying for it? Yeah, there's a, a set of models. Uh, Amazon uh, uses, uh, uh, well it depends whether you're buying their compute service or their data service. I had a close look at their data service to compare the costing. And uh, they're so expensive because they charge you not just for storage, but they also charge you for volume in and volume out. So activity. Is a, is a key measure for them. The more active your data is, the more expensive using their services. Uh, some of the uh, uh, data service providers, data storage service providers, just charge based on storage, how much you're using, you know, how many gigabytes or petabytes, terabytes you're using at a time. Uh, the, uh, it, it's usually a combination of sub subscription and volume. So there's usually some sort of base level subscription. You know, we've got to pay a fee per month or per year, usually per month. And then there's some sort of volume related ratcheting up on top of that. For quite large organisations, uh, there's been a trend to take their own boxes and wires and do what's called virtualise them. And that's kind of like making your own private cloud in your own data centre stuff. Yeah, so once you've done that, you can then uh, contemplate having a hybrid cloud type idea which connects your private cloud to the external cloud. And that allows you to do, I mean, the jargon for this is cloud bursting. This is one example. So imagine that QUT. Uh, you know, we've got a certain capacity we're able to afford, right? But once a year, at enrolment time, right, 20,000 students want to hammer these machines all at the same time. So wouldn't it be great if just for a day or two, I can burst out of that private cloud and buy temporary use of a few of Amazon's computers 
just to run the enrolment software so the students get really good response time. So that's, that's the idea of cloud bursting through the use of these hybrid clouds, that you have a kind of a skeleton infrastructure of your own, but then use that as a launch pad where you have these peaks that rise above. Can I just chip in there on your point? What's Dropbox and where does that fit in? Is that owned by somebody like Google ultimately? Uh, uh, Dropbox is a file sharing service. Uh, it's, it's my preference. Uh, Anthony asked me to nominate my favourite services and I gave it number one as a file sharing service. I like Dropbox. Uh, I use it with my clients all the time. We use it as a way of uh, sharing file systems, basically. So we set up shared folders. I've got uh, just about every one of my clients. I've had Dropbox exchanges with, and uh, I've never blown the free limit. I just keep chucking stuff out. You know, I just move on to the next client, clean out all the stuff. So you get two gig for free. So it's only five bucks a month, I think, when you go up to 60 gig or whatever. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. Is this a Google application or a separate? Separate. Dropbox. Dropbox. I have all my files on the box. Yeah, it's good. It's not too good with NYOB. It doesn't, doesn't interact with that very well. Right. But for okay. everything else, it's really good. Okay. okay. Well, I've never had a problem with it. It's always worked for me. What does it do? I don't... Uh, it it, it, it it's lets you set up folders uh, very similar to what you set up in your PC, but somewhere else. So it's it's just, it just looks like a folder on your PC. Mm. So, mm. like you've got your My Documents folder now, mm. once you've installed it, it's just your Dropbox folder, and you can have the same filing conventions that you used to. It doesn't look any different, but it's not on your computer, so your computer gets all your copy. So just, just, it's yeah. all there. so just imagine your exact file system you've got at the yeah. moment, and just pick it up and put it under Dropbox. Yeah. All it then does is every so often it will just sync up to Dropbox. If you've got a computer at home or at a holiday house or whatever, you can just Dial in and it goes. And then your clients so it's a bit like Google Docs. It is. Yeah, yeah, same idea. Same idea. But I reckon it's easier to use than Google Docs. And your clients can then <laughs> access what you want them to as well. So, I mean, we, we haven't talked about the benefit of that. You started touching upon it. You know, this one copy for all, all users is a huge advantage, yeah. don't you think? That's what I like the most is the version control. Yeah. Especially, especially with trying not to use MYV ever again because. Yeah, the version control of that file mm. going from a client to you and out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a great little uh, video that uh, Google have that explains why you should go to Google Docs. Mm. And it only goes for about two minutes, <laughs> but it talks about this person uh, running a community newspaper who tries to manage the monthly uh, uh, preparation of the newsletter with half a dozen different authors who are all writing articles and sending different versions via email and backwards and forwards. She moves everything across to Google Docs and then it's just it's all control. One, one, one version, one right? Version. We're all working on the one version of the system, which is why we like Xero. We use, uh, I'm a client of Anthony's and uh, we use Xero with him. And it's fantastic because it's all there. So if, uh, if Vivian or either of us have any, have any issues, we can ring up and we're all looking at the same version of, of the data and working on the same version of the data together. So it's a fantastic aid to collaboration. I mean, the thing that struck me over the last few years is everyone sort of talks about cost saving as a reason to go to the cloud. There's so many other things that are so much more important than the cost saving associated yeah, with it. Yeah, well. yeah. Well, that's the, a lot of clients who I try to get across to zero, the first question they ask me is about the security, and I sort of say, that's a lot more secure than your laptop that's sitting on your desk and will probably <laughs> sit in the office yes. overnight on your desk. And so. trust me to be an IT provider and mm. me back up your data, why not use someone that that's they do. <laughs> yeah. And the speed of their innovation is phenomenal too. So you're not having to upgrade software packages. A bit about security. Uh, and this gets back to your question about multi-tenancy. Because cloud services are multi-tenant services, right, they get the kind of economies of scale that you were noticing with bureau. Right? You run a bureau service, you're sharing something. So you generate economy of scale by that sharing. Uh, cloud services are certainly multi-tenant services. But because they're multi-tenant services, they all commit to the necessary security between the different tenants' data. So they use encryption, right? They encrypt the data, yeah. probably better than anyone in the room, authentication and authorization services on top of that encryption, right? So they've got security systems, which would, I pretty much say without a doubt, maybe the banks would compete, but most of us in the room would not want to run a security system as advanced as they run over the top of the data. So, your point, <laughs> there's no comparison, 
right? The data is much more secure with cloud service providers. Now, that's not the same as access to your data, right? They've got your data, right? There have been instances of data mail, yeah, cloud service providers who've refused to return data to people. So my view of that is, and this is one of the, the classic risk factors that you've got to do something about is, how have you made sure you've got a copy of your data, right? You've either got to do that or you've got to accept the risk and be pre prepared to start again. There are actually data escrow services, so contemplate this. You can hire yet another cloud service provider, different to the one that you're running your service through, just to keep a copy of your data, see? And if you were really nervous, you could hire three of them to keep three different copies at three different cloud service providers. Banks, uh, banks are moving to the cloud, they're certainly moving to hybrid cloud. Right? And banks, in fact, have got a long tradition of having shared facilities, right? transaction processing networks and the like. So they've been doing things together for quite a long time. Right? And part of the reason for them doing that is to share the costs of meeting the very onerous uh, uh, regimes that are put in place upon them we would expect to be put. We could talk about the latest trends in terms of cloud services. I think the hottest stuff that's going on is uh, the integration of the cloud with software on desktops and software on these devices. Mm. Right? So there's some very clever things happening which are about uh, using the power of the cloud but using the power of these things mm -hmm. right, to get away from some of the weaknesses in the cloud like response time. So uh, uh, these, you see uh, improvements in Dropbox for example around what it provides for you to make it much more seamless right, experience between the two. Uh, the uh, iCloud is going to be very uh, important to watch. What Apple are able to achieve because of that proprietary control top to bottom from the cloud through their iMacs and into these devices, I think it's going to set the standard probably for next generation uh, cloud services over the next few years. It's going to be very interesting how powerful that becomes for them as, as, a, as a tool. The, uh, I, I, we play around, as I said before, with smartphone apps and uh, we use a thing called uh, uh, a service called BuzzTouch. I, I looked around for web services that would automate the process of manufacturing smartphone applications. And this thing called BuzzTouch, uh, you don't have to do any code. It actually lets you enter the features of your application and then it generates smartphone applications for you and it lets you download them either as an iPhone app, an Android app, uh, or whatever. And you still have to do all the software development kit compiling, so it's not that easy. Uh, well, I spoke about uh, risk management and community standard. So there's a kind of thing with community standards, isn't there? You know, what's, what has the community by and large accepted as something that's okay to do? So I thought, for example, Gmail. So we use, we've got, I've got two email addresses, right? I've got one which is uh, 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 near cloudjuice.net, right? the domain name that we bought. But uh, I use Gmail all the time. And I have not sensed any reluctance in people using Gmail as my email service, even though they're effectively putting anything they send me on a server somewhere outside the Australian border. But federal government employees, they talk to me via email, via Gmail. Right? So there's this notion I'm trying to put to you of a community standard. Now once something becomes accepted by the community as okay to do, right, how much due diligence am I going to put into Google? I mean, what's the point? How much due diligence did you put into Microsoft the last time you bought one of their software licenses? I'd be going with the number one, two or three. You know, unless there was a really good reason for me to think about something else. And, uh, with email, uh, I use both. So here's an idea for you. You can do your own redundancy. I use both uh, Google and Windows Live. So I have both accounts. And uh, Microsoft won't let you do this, but Google will. So I on forward everything that comes to my Gmail account to my Windows Live account. So I have a fully redundant email set up. And on the, on the one occasion when Google wasn't available to me in the last two years, I was able to go to my Windows Live account and continue to do my email. Painfully, because I had to remember how to drive it. But nonetheless, I could do email. And they're both free, so it's not much cost. One thing I'd like to do quickly is, um, as Neil indicated, uh, Neil is a client of ours, and we do all his accounting in Xero. And Neil, who is with us, has done a bit of research on the various products out there that um, you might find interesting. Uh, 
just the various facets of, of the accounting packages. Uh, will they have bank feeds? Will they run payroll, inventory, financial reports, etc., etc.? And um, generally, I think it's felt that Zero is pretty much uh, one of the leaders. But there is a move. Sasu are out there doing this sort of stuff. Eclipse have got a, a practice management um, product. So there is a move to, to move your entire applications if you're a, if you're a, a practice into the clouds. Your practice management, your client base, your tax, your accounting, your financial reports, which Zero can now produce. We, we appreciate you coming to share with us. Um, I think you would have gauged from the interaction that it's an interesting topic to us. And it's, it's very much where the profession's headed, I believe, where, um, you know, where you can go with your iPad to a client and drill into their numbers and explain it all, etc., etc. So very much uh, the way of the future as far as I'm concerned.